afternoon, everybody. I'm Kimberly Steinke. I'm Senior Director for Exceptional Student Education in Orange County Public Schools in Orlando, Florida. In Florida, we call special education exceptional ed because we include gifted services in our programs. So um, when we say ESE, we're talking all of our students with disabilities and our gifted learners. Our team that's here today, like I said, I'm Kimberly Steinke. We have um, LaTanya Green, who's one of my directors for compliance and procedures, and Sarah Wallerstein Corin, who's our, one of our attorneys for our district and handles all of our special ed cases. So they can introduce themselves a little bit more when we get to their, their sections. We strictly did a strict PowerPoint. We're not meditating. We're not doing any kind of um, stuff like that. It'll be a, pretty much sit and get, but we do want to make sure that we allow enough time at the end for questions and, and answers. Um, we're pretty straight, straight shooters, so um, we just want to tell you about the th things that we've done in our district to improve our dispute resolution practices over the last several years. Um, I am a former special ed teacher at the high school level. I was then a dean of students and then an assistant principal at a middle school for several years before coming to the district um, to do compliance and procedures and then became the senior director and now have oversight of all of the um, special ed programs and all of that and report to. We actually have a senior executive director that I report to um, that leads our entire department. So we'll, we'll sh I'll show a little bit more about that in a minute. In Orange County Public Schools, um, our core business is educating children which is, I'm sure, the same as yours in some way, shape, or form, regardless of what role you serve. Um, I want to start out by giving you an overview about our district so you can understand where we're coming from as far as the scope of our responsibilities and the kids that we serve. Um, our vision is to be the top producer of successful students in the nation, and the way that we make that happen is by leading our students to success with the support and involvement of our families and our community. We are the 10th largest school district in the country. We are the fourth largest in our state. Um, we have been a part of the Council of Great City Schools and the Urban Collaborative and many other organizations across the country in working with our students in our other very large districts. So we participate in a lot of those activities and get a lot of our practices and things that we learn from our colleagues in those those big districts. Our enrollment has continued to increase over the last decade. As of the beginning of this month, we had just reached 199,600 students. So yes, we are massive. Um, and it's, it's a chore, definitely, to do what we do. Um, everybody likes to move to sun, sunny Central Florida, for sure. How many know what is the biggest place in Central Florida that everybody likes to go to? Disney, Disney World. Okay, so we're the second largest employer um, in Central Florida behind Disney World. We have over 23,000 employees. 60% of them are instructional, so our teachers. We have a th over 1,000 administrators and all of our classified support staff, nearly 8,000 of them. That's as of September, this past September. We have students from 201 countries who speak 163 different languages and dialects. 13% um, of our students we consider are English language learners. Obviously another aspect of dealing with our special ed students is how many of them are also ELL students and we're doing a lot of work in um, collaboration with our ELL department to service those students. Our socioeconomic status, we are highly diverse economically. We have everyone from your um, superstars that live in our high affluent communities all the way to our um, homeless students. We have a very large homeless population in our district, um, but 62.2 percent of our students last year were on free and reduced lunch. To operate our, our schools, we have 125 elementary schools, 35 middle schools, 3 K-8s, 19 traditional high schools, 40 charter schools, and growing. We are always getting applications for charter schools six ESE sites that we have oversight of just from our department, 22 alternative education sites. We have 929 school buses on the road every day that transport 86,000 students, and we serve 168,000 meals every day, which is about serving 70% of the population of Central Florida every day on a daily basis. Our graduation rate for last year was 88.1%. And just to put that in perspective, our graduation rate in the year 2000 was less than 50%. So we have continued to climb and do really well with our um, graduation rate over the last several years. 
We have a very, very supportive school board, very collaborative with our superintendent, um, and just everybody leadership-wise from the top down working very well together. As a result of that, actually, we in 2014 we're a winner of the Broad, Broad Prize for Urban Education. If you don't know what that is, it's basically like getting an Oscar in education. Um, we're very proud of it and worked very hard for it. The Broad organization recognizes districts for student performance while closing the achievement gap among low-income students and students of color. So as a result of winning the Broad Prize, we received $500,000 for student scholarships for the class of 2015. When we get into just our exceptional student education um, program and, and directly what LaTanya and Sarah and I work with, we have 33,648 students that are served in our programs. Over 12,000 of them are gifted and over 22,000 of them are students with disabilities. And we have had a very strong push over the last couple years to identify our gifted learners, especially in our lower um, economically um, disadvantaged schools and so our gifted numbers are increasing every day um, as we're finding more and more of those students. They're typically underserved and under identified. This is the breakdown of our ESC students and how many of them we have in our various programs. Up until about two years ago specific learning disabilities was our highest population and like I said um, we are identifying more and more gifted students so that's why those numbers have flipped. Um, you can see the breakdown in the other areas. Our autism spectrum disorder category has also continued to increase, which is the same as the trends nationally. Um, but these are the different programs that we serve. And that accounts for actually 11% of our population in our district. Just to give you a kind of just a quick scope of what our department does, like I said, we are led by our senior executive director, Dr. Cartwright. Then I'm the senior director. We have LaTanya, who does all the procedures and compliance. Um, we have a director for ESC policy. She handles all of our services for our non-public students, our parentally, parentally placed private school students who get services under IDEA. We have a specific division that works with our charter schools just for ESC services, because as we know, charter schools, like they're, as the, they're growing, and many of them do not have education backgrounds, especially in special ed, so we have a specific department that works specifically with them. She also handles, um, has oversight of our IDA grant and all of our federal dollars that come in and serves as the funds manager for that. And then the state of Florida has a student scholarship program for students with disabilities called the John McKay program, and so she has, um, Beverly has oversight of that. We have a director just for ESC curriculum and instruction, and she sits alongside all of our other curriculum directors across the district for elementary, secondary, different areas, um, does everything curriculum wise. Linda handles all of our behavior support, so she handles all of our behavior analysts, behavior specialists, behavior techs, um, any of our special schools that have, serve our behaviorally challenged students. Health services, even though it's not an ESC component, it falls under our department because we have all the nurses. So years ago, they just put health under um, ESE. And then Linda has all specialized instruction with our deaf, hard of hearing, vision impaired, or OT, PT, all of those programs. We have a director for all of our psychologists and social services. We have over 90 school psychologists and nearly 50 something um, school social workers across the district. And that is very, very low for our district. It's definitely an area where we need more people and then we have a director um, who handles all specialized services. She has all speech language. Um, she also handles all of our transition services for our st um, students who are going into post-secondary programs, students with disabilities. She has all of our assistive technology. And then we have a whole division for preschool diagnostic intervention services for our, um, our babies that are getting evaluated. And then we have Sarah, who's our, our love. You'll find. <laughs> We actually, the three of us, work together fabulously and have for many years and love each other dearly, not only professionally but also personally. So um, this, is, this is fun for us to be able to share what we do together. So as far as getting into some of the collaborative practices that we do with our schools and in our district um, and various departments and in various ways that we are trying to be proactive in what we do for dispute resolution specifically. Um, 
many years ago, before the three of us were actually in, at the district level, um, we were going through a series of our LEA determination for our district. Was that a needs improvement, needs assistance um, category for a few years? And um, not that the three of us came in and did anything magical or wonderful to change that, but um, there, was, there was a definite focus um, for improvement in those areas, specifically targeted at some of those indicators that fall in the LEA profile. Um, you heard um, Ruth Ryder talk yesterday about the focus on compliance for SEAs and, and you know, how that was all going for many years, and that's where we were. We were so focused on compliance that we knew that was where we needed to improve. So we, we've seen some of that, and we have been at a meets requirements status for the last several years. So we've definitely made imp um, improvement. But in the ways that we did that is what we want to share. So one of the very first things that we have been very specific on, and, and this has been an area that our superintendent has been very conscious of pushing, not only for our special ed department and services, but also in all of our departments and with our, with our schools, um, is our focus on professional development, specifically for school administrators, but it did also go into some teacher areas and support staff areas. Um, but what you're gonna see here is specifically a lot of the information that we did for our school administrators. Research shows and tells us that we know that district leaders face a lot of the challenge of increasing the numbers of highly qualified principals who can meet the demands of closing achievement gaps and raising student achievement. That's nothing new. This is, the research is a little old, but it's still fresh and relevant today. Um, we know that our education leaders face a significant amount of pressure for, do, for closing the achievement gap and, and reading the, meeting the um, achievement standards of our kids. Um, when it comes to special education, that adds a whole nother layer that we know a lot of principals or school leaders, assistant principals, um, unless you come out of school specializing in special ed, it's not necessarily an area that traditionally you would have a lot of experience in. Um, so um, while it's not necessary for them to be experts in special ed, they definitely need to have a good working knowledge of special ed practices and, and what's best for our kids. Research shows that effective school leaders who are current with special ed practices and research understand the needs of students with disabilities, including the guidelines and the regulations set forth under IDEA. So getting to know that law and some of the specific things of it um, is definitely important for school leaders. So we used that, um, part of that research was used to develop a series of ESE online administrator training modules. There's actually 14 to date that have been completed and a 15th one is actually <laughs> in draft form and has been for several months. It's the three of us just putting, updating all the legal stuff. These are the first eight um, that all administrators based on our superintendent's guidance were required to complete these. Um, they are all strictly um, online. They had about a six month period to do it. Um, we had to track and monitor who did it and report it and all those fun things. Um, there is a ninth module that is specifically for teachers, and there was a couple summers ago, well actually every summer for the last three years, teachers have had modules in the summer that they're not, they're not required to complete, but if they complete it, they earned extra money during the summer. So um, the first summer that it happened, based on our model of our modules, um, our, mod our teacher module was one of the ones they had to do the first year and was very successful. We also have a model, module on UDL practices now that's been um, highly taken, but overall out of all of our modules, in fact we also have, I'm like just, we have one for law enforcement officers, so all of our SROs take one, or there's one available for them. We have one for transportation services, so all of our bus drivers and our bus monitors have one. We have one for paraprofessionals, one for school secretaries, um, many, many different modules based on different areas. One for parents, which I'll talk a little bit about more later. But overall, as of this past month, we've had over 14,000 participants complete our modules and other districts that have actually come in and said, can you give us your <laughs> modules? And we're like, dang, now we should really be selling them. <laughs> um, but some of the comments that came out um, as a result of our modules and just for how powerful they were, um, this is just a quote from one of our assistant principals. Um, actually, he, he made a few more comments and just said how powerful it was with his staff. He'd been 
really trying to work with his staff and he was a father of a special ed student so really getting trying to get them on board with what's required to serve special education students and just really felt that our module was exactly what he needed between the administrator side of it and the teacher side of it it really gave the ump for what he was trying to push forward at his school so then of course part of doing professional development is you want to get feedback from the people that take it so six months after all the administrators were required to complete the module we did a survey with them we just asked five simple questions um, true false statements just to get an idea of what they thought about the modules um, there were 666 people surveyed, 41% of them responded. And this was some of the things that they reported back after taking um, the modules. 45% felt that when faced with a situation regarding an ESC student, they've referred back to the modules for some information. So it was a piece of where they could get some information. They've implemented a practice or a strategy with their staff that they specifically learned in the modules. 55% of them had reported that they did that. 87% of them responded that the module helped them to understand more about their specific role and their responsibilities in serving um, students with disabilities and gifted learners. And that was really one of the powerful things that we wanted. They were asking, what do I do in this situation? You know, and every time we're dealing with disputes or we're dealing with families and you know, we go back to the school and <laughs> we're working with them. They just, schools just didn't know what to do. So this was a way of really helping guide them and, okay, here's what you do in the situation or here's what your responsibilities are. 71% of them said that they have paid closer attention to the needs of our kids as a result of completing the modules, as well as working with their parents or their, or their guardians. And 67% responded that they, the modules provided them with information related to ESC that they had not previously been exposed to, which can be a good thing or can be looked at honestly as a bad thing because how you know why is it the first time that they're learning about some of this information based on our modules and that goes into a whole nother layer of information looking at leader preparation programs and college programs and things like that and then we just put a few more comments in about um, what they felt about the modules and and how the training and professional development helped them. Okay, so that was one of the techniques that we've used, um, one of the practices that we've used to help with our schools. Another area that we are really big on, um, and actually there was a session that I went to, I think not yesterday, but the day before, that was all about parent engagement. And one of the questions they asked in the, in the session was, um, what level of parent act engagement activities do you have in your district? And it was a scale and you just respond. Was anybody else in that session? Okay. So I was one of the ones that said, we have it and I could be giving this training. Um, we have a very strong parent engagement component across our district. Um, not only just in, spe in the special ed department, but also in our Title I department and then just district wide. We have parent academies and all kinds of things. But over for more than 10 years, way before I even got to the district, as a part of um, under IDA, it's required to have a parent engagement component, we have our ESC parent support team. Um, they are funded through our IDA grants, so everything that we do with them, um, come, the funding comes from there. We set aside a portion of it. Um, I have five parents of students with disabilities who report to me. They serve as vendors, so they're not actual district employees, but they are contracted um, and they're available for our parents 24 7 they give out their cell phones email addresses they have their phones on the expectation is is that if a parent calls them at midnight they are to either answer the phone or contact that parent first thing in the morning and that's what we we advertise for our parents um, they offer peer support they have access to all kinds of community resources um, one thing about Orlando is is we have very sophisticated hospitals and a, a variety of services for students and families with disabilities. So there are a lot of families of students with those types of needs that move to Central Florida. Um, so we have a lot of things in place. Um, so our team, our parents have access to all of that and um, put all that information out. And they act as a resource be, and a conduit between the schools and the families, more from, you know, from a parent to a parent, which is often a way of providing a secure kind of non-confrontational, less scary situation for parents. Um, they help parents make informed educational choices about their children and what they're going to do, um, especially those that are either new to our district or just for the first time having to deal with 
the identification of their child as a student with a disability, which we all know can be very, um, very scary and, and a process that people have to, parents have to deal with. Um, but the main part of the program and, and what we preach about them and, and their mission is that they're, to, they're there to empower parents to advocate for themselves. Um, one of the things that we, I tell my ladies, and it sometimes sounds kind of crazy, is the less IEP meetings you attend, the better. I know you're doing your job because you're, what they do is, is they work with the parents and they talk with the parents prior to the parent going to the IEP meeting. And they talk to them about some of the issues and they talk to them about what they're going to be engaging in and they walk them through the process. And their mission is to really empower that parent so that parent can walk in feeling confident, feeling like, you know, not as scared as when they walk in and that they don't have to lean on one of the parent support team ladies as their advocate or as their person in the meeting with them. Now they will attend IEP meetings, don't get me wrong. Um, but we kind of pride ourselves on if, you know, if you're really doing your job and you're really meeting with those parents and you're really working with them prior to the meetings, then you won't be attending that parent. That parent will feel confident going in and won't feel like they need you. Sure. Are they paid? Yes, they are paid. Yes. And I have, there's five of them. One thing I didn't say about our district is we are broken down into five learning communities in our district because we are so big. Um, we have five traditional learning communities, each serving from about, on average, about 35 schools. And then we have another school transformation office that has a set of schools that are lower performing um, schools that they focus on with a lot more intervention and things like that. So my five ladies each have a learning community that they support. I have one that serves as a lead and she's been around forever and knows the program. Um, she's trained in all kinds of national training things, um, but then they each, they're, they're divided up and they, the learning communities that they support are where they live too. So we've been able to manage that. Um, one of them is also supports all of our Spanish families from across the district. And one of the other ladies works with our um, Arabic and Haitian Creole families because that's a large part of our population. Um, so like I said, they work in our learning communities <laughs> um, and they help parents you know, navigate through this, this different systems. They respond to parent emails, parent phone calls, they attend meetings. Um, last year they responded to over 500 phone calls and almost 200 emails. Um, they attended well over 90 community events and meetings throughout the year. Um, sometimes we have multiple, multiple events on the same day, so they're spreading themselves out and we have a whole table and pamphlets and all the stuff that we give out, so they're always out in the community. And then throughout the year we host family forums um, for our families of students with disabilities where they engage in We'll have it somewhere in the, learn in the district and invite parents to come in and just spend a day or a morning answering questions about ESC and what it's like in our district and what services we have and, and different things. Um, and then one of the biggest areas that we focus on too, not only by being that resource and that, that support for families, is a large component of what they do is parent training. Um, and this is where the results of this is a, has assisted in our dispute resolution practices. Um, so we have an introduction and an overview for ES, of all ESE parents. Um, that, that is an online module. Um, and then many of these other ones, they actually do face-to-face -face trainings or they're actually, they've, we've built them into online modules as well. So we will either do these trainings at some of our parent academies that our district does once a month, district-wide, and we'll be one of the sessions or they will go to a school, a school staffing specialist may call and say, you know, I've got a group of parents that really is new and can you come do a training for them? So they'll come do that. Um, we have some of our local community organizations and agencies that will have meetings of, you know, the Down Syndrome Association um, is very active in our area. So we'll go and do some trainings for them, but we collaborate on a lot of those things. So these are different areas that they have done um, that we have set trainings built on and that we provide for parents and it's been been very powerful for many years and we're always trying to add something new Can I ask a question? sure are are your parents that you have are they connected or part of your state i know you have more than one parent center mm -hmm. in florida but it, are you are part of it are we lean on them as a resource but we're not directly part of it no um, but Sarah Sequencia, who's our lead parent support team member, is part of the, she's been, like I said, she's been around 
and part of parent support for many, many years, and she was part of the, the family training network, whatever it's called, I forget in Florida, um, and has had all that training, and that's why she serves as our lead. She's done the policy making training and all those things, so she works very um, directly with that. She's part of our state SAC um, for families, so we're connected in that way with, with the parent training center. No, everything for our families is free. There's never anything they have to pay for for anything. And then one of the biggest things that we do, um, well, we keep, we do a lot of things, but one thing that we are very um, proud about is our Pulse Conference that we have every February. And um, we've been having this for several years. And a few years ago when I took over supervision of the parent support team, I said, okay, ladies, it's time to make it bigger and better. And let me tell you, they met the, they met the goal um, for the last several years we've had almost 500 families attend and participants come to our pulse conference it's a saturday in february we have guest speakers come we have a keynote address and then we have a variety of sessions throughout the afternoon that families can go to they're about 45 50 minutes long um, we have everything from transition to pre-k services to iep goal writing um, stuff about our McKay program, all, you name it, we behavior, anything um, that, that they would might need and need access to, they come. They bring their kids, they're allowed to you know, bring their students. We did many years ago provide childcare, but that got to be where we couldn't hand, we didn't have the, the resources to do that, but we still welcome them to bring their kids with them. Um, we have particip uh, presentations from people in our district and then community agencies that come. The only thing we don't allow is groups to come and try and sell something and sell a service. We say, no, we're not here for you to advertise and, and sell your products. We do have a vendor hall, so we will allow them to set up as vendors, but we won't allow them to present. Um, and this has proven to be one of our most successful events every year. And it's, it's huge putting it on. I mean, the ladies get a little stressed about it, but it's very successful and our families love it. We feed them free lunch that day. And um, we have, you know, Nemours sponsors it, um, Autism Society of Florida. So we have some big sponsors that help us with that. So that is um, the two things that I had to present, professional development parent support team. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah. My name is Sarah Corin, and I am one of the attorneys in our school district. Because we are so large, we have seven of us in-house, and we also contract out of house. My main jobs are um, to address needs for students with disabilities, gender identity, sexual orientation, um, and also any other protected class that we have in issues with students with disabilities. So if there was a discipline matter and it was a student with a disability, then it would come to me. Um, Prior to working for Orange County Public Schools, and this is my fifth school year at OCPS, which is wow. kind of crazy for all of us, um, the first six years I was an attorney who sued school districts for a living. I created a program in Orange County that brought um, educational advocacy to foster children, and I'm proud to say that that program is still in effect. So when attorneys from our Guardian Ad Litem program and our DCF agencies come in and they're providing legal representation to our students, um, it's a great thing for us because if a kid has fallen through the cracks and they do need legal representation, then it's, then it's important that we know so that we can help that child. So I have, a, I have a bilateral perspective on this situation because I used to be on the quote unquote other side. And we were one of the districts you sued, so. <laughs> on a regular basis. <laughs> um, so it's, it's been an interesting dynamic to come over to Orange County over the years. I can say I'm very proud to work there. Um, before we get into the actual um, due process and mediation portion of the dispute resolution, I just wanted to point out a few things because once you get to that point, the process is broken down. To go off of what Kimberly already talked about with training, one of the things that we initiated in our district from the legal department two years ago were trainings called Legal 101 and Legal 102. And those trainings are required trainings for our assistant principals and our principals. And they come to one of our high schools on a day when high school's closed and there are seven of us, so they get seven periods, and they have to go from each lawyer in our district to the other lawyer. We make them wait on the lunch line during lunch, which is kind of payback and a lot of fun. Um, but in each training, you know, we give them the basics, and it allows us to say, you know, for me, not just do this, do this, and do this, but 
principal X at the high school, this is why you have to do this. This is why the child find obligation exists. This is why it's important to serve your ESE students. I'm able to use examples from when I was an attorney on the other side and I always talk about one client in particular who um, you know, was very low functioning and when they found him naked scavenging for trash at the age of two, no one ever thought that he would amount to anything. He's now an adult and he lives in an APD group home and every day he gets picked up and brought to the pet store and he feeds the animals and then he goes home and he has a job and he has worth in life. So IDEA can be one thing you know, for one student or it can be something for another student, but it allows us to explain to our assistant principals and principals why we're asking you to do what you're doing, which in turn, I believe, empowers the principals to go back to their schools and not just say you have to do this, but this is why you need to do it. And it gives them an understanding when they're working with parents about why they're doing what they're doing and why it's important to do what they're doing. And it's not just a mandate or a requirement or you know, a checkbox that they have to make sure happens. So that understanding is really important. Um, before we ever get to a legal process in our district, and LaTanya can talk about it also a little more, we have an extensive network of ESC staffing specialists, program specialists, district staffing specialists, um, and LaTanya Green and I who work with our schools, and we are always ready. So before we ever get to the actual legal process, my phone rings a million times a day, as does LaTanya's, with schools and they'll say we have a parent here and they're angry or we think we did something wrong we need help so I, I think creating that community amongst our schools first and foremost has been extraordinarily important because our schools are no longer in fear of calling their administrators or their lawyer to say Houston we have a problem whether it's a problem that a family has created or a problem that we have created if someone believes there's a problem we try to go in from a more senior level and help the schools before it ever gets to the legal process, before it ever gets to a state complaint, before it ever gets to a civil rights complaint, to say, hey, what are you doing? What do we need to fix? Do we need to come to the table in an IEP meeting? Do we need to call the mother? Do we need to not even call the parent yet, but we know that we messed something up? So staffing, you know, speech therapist who didn't provide 13 hours of services, let's get a plan in place to make those up. So by the time the parent may or may not ever notice that there's a problem, we've already fixed it. So I think that community and that trust that our schools have developed with our ESE department is incredibly important in making sure that you have a collaborative process all the way around. Because frankly, in our district, it wasn't always that way. Um, our district's perspective for a long time was to fight um, almost everything that came through. And over the years, um, our ESE department has worked extraordinarily hard to change that dynamic into a collaborative process. And it's a process where parents who have been involved before will call me as the school district lawyer even and say, hey, Sarah, I've got a problem. So it's, it's much more of a collaborative process. The attorneys in the area know us and will call me directly before they ever file something or even come to a meeting. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would say staff. staff. I would also say um we had a we had a change yeah. in, we had some leadership changes. Um, I think our LEA's determination status when it came in as a needs improvement, needs assistance, all those things. I mean that was a shock. That was okay, what's going on? And um, you know some analysis or we didn't, but the, our predecessors did and um, just said, okay, what are we doing here? There was some reorganization of our of our structures. Um, Sarah's position actually never existed until she was hired. Um, so it was probably yeah. the three of you, you mm -hmm. know, getting promoted. <laughs> it was a change. It was We're a lot being of. Recorded, so. it, it was. There, there was a huge. There was a huge. The realistic situation is there was a huge shift in the district, and I think our senior leaders realized that there needed to be a change. And with um, a change in staff and a change in perspective, and you know, having all of us come together and say really what needs to be done. And I'll show you our numbers in a minute, and I, I think they do really reflect 
some of the changes that we've had over the years, and I'll talk about some cases quickly because I know we don't have a lot of time, about how we've changed things. Um, but I really, I wanted to highlight all of those things because they are really much, they are very important. So since I've been in Orange County, and this is the only way that I can look at it, I wanna explain again, we have 33,000 students with disabilities. 22,000 of them are students um, with, with disabilities and the other 12 are gifted, but we all call them exceptional student education. We've only had that many due process complaints. It's a fairly low number. Um, it did rise for a little bit for a couple of years. We had some advocates in our community who were filing due process first and then coming to the table second. And um, I think over time those advocates have realized that filing first, um, kind of yelling at the rain first and then coming to the table second wasn't getting them anywhere. And their clients were starting to realize that they were paying for a service that frankly they really didn't need. Because by the time they were coming to the table for the resolution meeting or the mediation, um, they were getting what they wanted in most circumstances if we had done something wrong. We've only taken to final hearing cases um, that we really felt needed to go to final hearing because as an attorney for the district, my position is that we're going to fight the fights that we need to fight and we're going to fight the fights that are worth fighting and um, to give an example you know a student having sexual intercourse in the bathroom and then the mother wants to say it's a manifestation of their ADHD you know that is a fight that we will probably take to court you know if they say they don't want them suspended for 10 days or something of that nature but you know most of the fights that we've had frankly if it's gotten to a due process there has been some sort of issue somewhere that we needed to address that is the realistic situation because we, um, we try to address everything before it gets to that point. Um, I do want to highlight very quickly before we keep going that um, up until yesterday we were at zero due process in our district. <laughs> we are now currently at one um, and it is a district filed due process actually because we believe we need to protect the rights of a student. Collaboration through the legal process. Of course, legal proceedings between parents and schools are inherently adversarial. And what we like to tell our schools and what I tell our schools all the time is that if we get to due process, regardless of if the school has done everything right or not, we've done something wrong. Because if we've gotten to due process, then something has broken down. Um, I, I equate it to, you know, the mother is speaking white and the school district is speaking black. You know, or the mother is speaking red and the school district is speaking blue. We are not speaking the same language and we are not communicating. So regardless of if we believe that we've done everything right, something has broken down in the process because we've gotten to a lawsuit. Um, it's important to realize that everything ultimately is about the child. So even through our due process and what I'm going to talk about for the next couple of minutes is maintaining focus on the needs of the child while you're going through litigation. That's often really hard for our staff to do because our teachers are warm and fuzzy and I tell them that all the time. So, you know, I'll talk about some strategies that we use for that. The first thing that we do in a general level and what I always empower our teachers and our administrators to do in Legal 101 and Legal 102 is to remind our staff that it's not about them. Um, our staff are there to do a job. I understand that they are warm and fuzzy and our teachers truly want to be there to help kids. But a due process is not about the teacher. It's about the kid. And I try to explain to our administrators so that they can convey to their teachers before I get there if that teacher felt that someone was aggrieving their child and they had the legal means to go through and file a claim, then they would. So we need to respect the fact that there is a parent out there that feels so strongly about what's going on with their own child that they're willing to file a lawsuit. Because frankly, if there were more parents that were as involved with their children as these parents, our kids would be better off. So we try to keep the focus on that. Um, we also try to remind our staff that it's LaTanya's job and my job to focus on the legal matter. Um, that's why I have a job. I have a job to make sure that the pleadings are filed and the investigation's done and we do all of that. It's the teacher's job to teach. And it's the teacher's job to remember that Bobby, Johnny, Cynthia, Laura, you know, whatever child in their class didn't file this due process. You know, we have had 19, 20, 21 year olds, you know, file an OCR complaint or something, but Generally, our special needs kids are not the people that are filling out the request for a due process with our Division of Administrative Hearings. So we want to make sure that we don't take it out on our kids. 
So how do we try to get through this? Because again, if you saw the numbers, we have only actually gone to final hearing in the district once or twice. Um, one time we did get an order against us and it was a phone hearing and one time the family did not show. So um, in the four years that I've been there, we've never actually made it to a final hearing and um, we have not given away the farm in doing that. It's been a collaborative mm -hmm. process. So how do we get there um, is the key here. The first step is I have the school district send me everything. You name it, I want to see it. Unless it's a personal note, I want to see it. I want to look through it as a fresh pair of eyes. I initially don't even want to talk to the school. I don't want to know what's going on. I just want to look at it so that I don't have the teachers and the principals in my ear um, and that I can look at it from an independent perspective and see what's going on. Um, I look at it for procedural and material reasons. You know. A lot of times I do file a motion to dismiss because there is a material reason to do so. But I also inform our school that it doesn't mean that this is going away. It just means that I'm buying us a little more time to see what we really need to do. The second step, the second step is the most dreaded step by our faculty, I'll be quite honest. Um, no one likes this, but in Florida, and I don't know what the procedures are everywhere else, but we need to have a resolution meeting or a mediation really quickly, and our response to due process is due 10 days after the filing. So I am at the school usually three to four days later, and I meet with every single staff member that has worked with the child in the past two years. I prefer to have all of the staff members in the room all at the same time, and we do kind of a number system. Uh, everyone gets a number, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And the first person that talks tell me everything that they think I need to know about the child, how they're doing in school, if they're on grade level, what mom's like, what dad's like, what problems they've had, if they've been bullied, what we've been done about it, whatever. The way that I have found works best for us is that once you have spoken, you can then chime in for someone else. So if we're now on number eight and number one remembers something, then they can chime in. But we don't let number nine talk until we get to number nine. And it allows us to kind of keep a rolling form of what's going on. And maybe we get to the ninth person and they say, everything one through four said. But at this rate, then I get an understanding of what's going on through the school. And I tell this team at that point, I need to know the good, the bad, the fantastic, and the dirty. Because the only way that we can address all of the issues is if I know everything. And I explain to our staff very, very openly what the process is. One of the things that we learned in the past was that our staff didn't understand what was going on in a due process and it freaked them out. So by, under, by explaining to them, you're not in trouble, you're not going to employee relations, you are not personally getting sued, you do not need to ruin your holiday break over this, things like that really help our staff have a more open involvement with the due process, which allows us to get all the information and figure out what we need. I also use it as a teaching time. So if I do identify things that are wrong right away, I let them know. Um, so that way, right away, right then I can say, hey, you know what, I've pinpointed this, this, and this that might be an issue in our due process. This is where the problem happens. This is why it's a violation of the law because again, it's really important for our teachers to not just be told. That's the biggest pet peeve of teachers. They're told what to do. They want to know why they're having to do what they have to do. So we explain to them right away, and this is why you should change it. Because if you don't, and now you know you're doing something wrong and you keep doing it wrong, it can be a violation of your job duties. So you want to make sure they know that. When I'm meeting with the faculty, one of the other things that I do that um, I forgot to mention in the last one is I go over the actual allegations of the complaint. Some attorneys agree with me that that's a good strategy, other attorneys don't. But I think that our teachers deserve to know what the parents are saying about them. Um, sometimes that's difficult, they cry, they get upset. No one likes to hear bad things, especially when they're not true. Um, but again, I remind our teachers that it's not personal and that's hard for them to understand sometimes because sometimes parents can be very, very nasty and parent attorneys can be very, very nasty in their pleadings. But our teachers need to know what's being said about them because frankly, I think that they deserve to. Um, and sometimes schools can be nasty too, don't get me wrong. Um, but the only way that we can work with parents moving forward, and the only way I think our teachers can work with parents in the next phases, is to honestly know what they're up against. Because the only way that a teacher can sit down with a parent and say, I want to help you, is to actually know what they're trying to help. After that meeting, I consult with our senior management. So it's usually me, Latanya Green, um, Kimberly or Dr. Cartwright, our um, 
head head of ESE, the area superintendent if they want to be involved in the matter. And we have a very frank discussion about where the kid is, what we should have done, what we shouldn't have done. If I think we have a winnable defense, if I don't, even if I think we can win, if it's right, um, we oftentimes weigh out just because we can win doesn't mean we should, go, we should go to court. And in a district as large as ours, and we do have resources, that doesn't mean we need to spend taxpayer dollars to go to court. And sometimes that's something that we have to have a very frank discussion about. Do we want to spend $30,000 in litigation costs <coughs> to do something that's going to cost $1,200 and mend a relationship with a family for a seven-year-old that we're going to have until they're 22. So we often have to balance that. And that's hard sometimes, depending on the principal or the superintendent that's involved or the administrator, et cetera. And we have to have a very frank discussion about that. Um, so in that, we develop a framework where the key players understand all the parameters about what's going on. And again, we analyze the costs. And those costs ju are not just about services, but also settlement agreements, et cetera. Um, we have looked the other way, and we have had parents, you know, where they have gone their merry way, and we have, you know, assisted them in doing so. We have to weigh all of the factors in that, because we want to make sure that at the end of the day, everyone can move forward, because that's really ultimately what we're looking at here. This is not a lawsuit where I sue you because I slipped and fell in your store, and I never have to go back to your store again. Although parents in Florida have many, many educational options for their kids, we have McKay scholarships, private schools, charter schools, we are the public school option. And if you live in Orange County, you know, you're going to get us and we're going to get you regardless of if we want you there or you want to be here. So we need to find a way to be friends and we need to find a way to work collaboratively together because ultimately that student's going to be in our district for another, you know, 10, 15 years. When we get to mediation or resolution, we use this time as a true attempt to address the needs of the student. My thought process is this. If we really have nothing to talk about, we need to be honest in that mediation or resolution se session and say, we really believe we have nothing to talk about. We're here to try to explain to you why we believe our position is correct. And sometimes we go to a mediation or a resolution session, and Latanya does our resolution sessions, and she does them extraordinarily well. And there have been times where she brings a, a load of paperwork to the table, and there's a giant discussion of what we've done, what we haven't done, what we need to do, et cetera. And sometimes it comes to the table and it's, here's the documentation to show that we've done everything. We're going to try to persuade you today to drop your due process. And that's really something that we have to look at. But we do need to come to the table in full faith and fidelity. And that's something that our district along the way has really come together in that when we go to a mediation or a resolution session, we are truly there in good faith and fidelity to work on the issues. It is not a you against me. We're not gonna scream and yell at each other. We have a code of civility in our district. We're gonna talk honestly and openly about the child and what the child needs under the law. Um, if mistakes have been made, we address them. We've made this mistake, this is how we're gonna fix it. Now, I do coach the staff ahead of time because we do have a pre-meeting, and I'll talk about that in a second real quick, about ways to craft a message. So before we have any meeting with a family, once we're in a legal situation, whether it's a resolution meeting or a mediation, I meet with the team that's going to be in that meeting. I can't be in the resolution meeting unless a lawyer's there, um, but you know we do meet. And I'll talk to our staff, and they'll tell me what's happened and we try to craft a message because you may not want to walk in there and say hey you know what we really bit the big one on this one you know that might not be the best way to explain it but at the same time we do have to admit when we're wrong and we have to admit it truthfully mm -hmm. so you know we talk about crafting a message and we talk about what are the hot button topics for a parent how to stay away from those or how to address them head on depending on what we need it's important that everybody at the table, because you may have an administrator who hasn't worked with the family on a daily basis to know, for instance, that this parent gets very angry if you call her miss instead of missus. Or this parent is divorced or dad's last name is this and mom's last name is that. It's important in preparation for the meeting that you don't just talk about the legal issues, but that you talk about the basics with the family. Because if you're coming to a meeting 
to try to resolve issues, you don't want to make someone mad over minutia that you should know. Um, so we talk about that. We are sure that all of the appropriate people are in the meeting. And I know that this seems basic, but a lot of times we used to, when we all first started, we'd have a resolution meeting or a mediation and we'd invite a teacher to the meeting or an administrator to the meeting and we'd get a response back to the calendar invite. Sorry, I'm teaching English too at that time. Or the principal would respond and say, I can't make my staff available at that time because they're doing this, this, and this. Over the years, we've explained to our staff that this is not optional. And that is a responsibility that we have to explain and that's something that we had to take ownership of as a district so that we could provide our parents the appropriate attention. Because truly the way to resolve these is to give our parents the appropriate attention. For settlement agreements, we use a binding document in our district. I don't advise our clients to just write in the IEP notes, we're gonna do A, B, and C. And the reason for that is because I wanna make sure that moving forward it's collaborative. And signing a settlement agreement feels like a very final thing for our, our parents feel like it's final. It feels like they got something. They're signing something. It's done. Um, on our side, it also feels very final. And it commits us very clearly to what we need to do and what the parents have to do. And it becomes a cutoff point. So I can say to our staff, all right, from here, we're moving on, folks. Um, and that, as it has in here, a list of things that we require. We do require a release. We document all of you know the dollars. And the thing in here that's really important is before we sign it, we make sure the staff that's responsible for implementing it knows and the staff that's responsible for paying for it knows. So once the settlement agreement is done, we can truly move forward with this family without the principal coming back in three weeks going, I didn't know I had to pay this or I didn't know I had to get the staff for this. Because it's important to make sure if we're going to end a due process, that we're going to end it and we're going to move on with the family. Again, if we have a hearing, I meet with all of our staff ahead of time. Um, I prep them as witnesses. Obviously, I cannot tell them what to say. And my favorite line for our staff is, do not say anything under oath that you would not say under oath in front of your mother, in front of Dr. Jenkins, in a court of law. Dr. Jenkins is our superintendent. Um, and I try to make sure that we're prepared. Because again, if we prepare our staff, then the staff knows we're on their side. And once it's over, I find that they're able to move on much more easily. Yeah. The settlement document is not confidential unless we all agree to make it confidential. Um, if it's done in mediation, then it depends on that. Um, if it's over a certain threshold in the state of Florida, so if it's a settlement over $50,000, then it's absolutely not confidential because anything over $49,999 and 99 cents needs to be voted on by our school board. Um, we do, I do put a provision in some of ours that say that the parent will not talk about it on social media, advertise it, this, that, and the other, but that they are able to talk to their accountants, their providers, et cetera, about it. Um, it depends on the nature of the agreement. If we're offering 20 hours of counseling, frankly, I'm not gonna fight with a parent over you know, the confidentiality of 20 hours of services. If we're paying a parent their matrix dollars for the next seven years so they don't come back, that's something that we would wanna enforce. Mm -hmm. the, enforceability. The, enforceab the enforceability of all of our documents, our settlement agreements, we um, put that the enforceability of the settlement agreement itself is in state court. Um, it wouldn't be the enforce, so only if you violate the settlement agreement, and then we would deal with that in state court. If they violate it and we do have proof of it, it would be grounds for us to stop any future payments and things like that. Um, we have some language in there about that on the parent. Well, or if we're paying the parent and the parent was to violate the settlement agreement. We would, have some we would have some provisions in there. Um, we've only had two or three very large settlement agreements in four years, um, I think two. And one of them occurred before I ever got there, um, the problems. So we've been really good at things. On the, on the school side, as far as enforceability, we hold the schools accountable oh. for every piece of whatever's in there that they're supposed to do, whether it's providing additional oh, speech yeah. hours or you know, a behavior support person or something like that, we hold them to it too because the first person that's going to scream that it's not happening is going to be the parent. They're going to scream to us and then we go right back right. to the school. And, and they're good. They know if it gets to that point, 
they better do it. Yep. So. Our principals also know over time that um, for certain violations and for certain costs, we've now started having our principals have to pay for them out of their school budgets. So our principals have gotten much more in tune with the ESE services on their campuses and what decisions are made because they know that if decisions are made that ultimately affect the provision of services for students, their final party for their staff might go away if they have to pay $2,000 to a private provider to make up for services. Um, so that message has really gotten through to our principals that ESE is important and they need to make sure that it's a priority in the school so that they don't lose their fund money. Um, we used to pay for it out of IDEA. So as far as enforceability above the district level for parents, they, they, would, to to state they would have a right to go back to court to enforce the settlement agreement. That has not happened in the four years that we have done it. Our district takes a very strong stance. We don't settle for anything that we are not ready, willing, and able to do. And that is a really important part of the settlement agreement we don't settle for something and we don't agree to something that we're not ready and able to do. And if for some reason an unforeseen circumstance comes in where we're not able to do something, we would immediately contact the parents to find an alternative solution. We wouldn't just try to ignore it because frankly, I don't want to end up in state court arguing about a settlement agreement that already came into effect because clearly we already did something wrong to start with. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look good for us. So we make sure it gets done. At the closing of the case, I just think it's important to remind our faculty that it's over and that they need to get over it. Um, and they do really much so do so. Sometimes we've had school transfers and other things depending on the litigation, but it's important to remind our faculty that we have to keep educating the child. And we do an extraordinarily good job of that. I think over the years our faculty has really learned that due process complaints are not about them and they do a really good job about moving forward and making the child the priority. Okay, Office for Civil Rights Complaints. We have had 11 since 2011. Um, we have had some that have been statewide complaints. Some of them have been smaller ones. Very few of them have had compensatory education result from them. And I handle our Office for Civil Rights Complaints in the exact same way that I handle our due process investigations. If we see ultimately right away that we have made a mistake and it is apparent that we believe that we can work with in full faith and fidelity to try to address an issue beforehand. Our goal is always to work with the parent, um, not usually through my office, but through Latanya's office and our school district to make sure that we can address the issue um, mm -hmm. because it's always better than you know working through the Office for Civil Rights and if there's something that needs to be fixed, we'll fix it. And again, if there's something that doesn't need to be fixed, We'll explain to the Office for Civil Rights why we believe we're right, but ultimately it's about making sure that we work with the parent and thorough investigation to make sure that we can figure out all of the issues. Latanya. You want to take our question real quickly? Oh, I can take your question real quick. Oh, can you just say a little bit more about the code of civility? I Sure, we have a code of civility in Orange County Public Schools, and it is a very clear document. You can find it on our website if you just type in code That's of civility. Of it. it governs the communication between school district employees and the public, school district employees and school district employees, and anyone that is having a communication on our campus. And it basically says that you have to be nice and respectful at all times, although in a two-page document. A parent has a right to come to an IEP meeting, they have a right to bang on a table once or twice. They have a right to be upset. They have a right to raise their voice. They have a right to cry. They do not have a right to bang on the table for 20 minutes. They do not have a right to tell our staff that Walmart must not have been hiring the day that they hired us. Um, parents do not have a right to have, you know, use racial slurs, um, be violent, things like that. On the flip side, neither do our staff. So it requires our staff in an IEP meeting or any other parent meeting or in communications with each other to keep their cool. If in an IEP meeting a parent violates the code of civility, we ask them to leave. We finish the meeting without them. On the flip side, if we have an employee in an IEP meeting who violates the code of civility, we also ask them to leave and we find someone else in their place if we need to. It hasn't happened in a very long time that we've had to have one of our employees leave because we all know about the Code of Civility and we know that we need to be appropriate and respectful. Um, but it's a really nifty document for when we need it.
I am LaTanya Green. I am the ESC Director for Procedures. And in Orange County, what that translates to is everything compliance under IDEA Section 504. I do handle, my office does handle dispute resolution for, uh, for the district. We try to curtail the issues before it gets to Sarah. And that's why we work hand in hand. We always make her aware of the issues. We make her aware of what's bubbling up. But my department uh, tries to handle it prior to it getting to that point. And we, we do a pretty good job of it. But unfortunately, sometimes things do happen and we have to move in that direction. But we pretty, you know, Sarah and I keep our hand on the pulse and kind of gauge where we are in the process um, in supporting our, huh? We, we do, we, we affectionately call each other freaking frack when we train together because, you know, she's good cop some days, sometimes I'm bad cop, and some days we flip. Just depends on what situation, we're very situational. Depends on what situation we're walking into. Uh, a little bit about my background, and I just kind of wanted to give it to you briefly. I started off as an ESE teacher, teaching uh, students with learning disabilities and emotional handicaps. Then I moved to the world of compliance. I was a staffing coordinator, which handled school-based compliance in our learning community, in our uh, district. Then I became a learning community program specialist, which is a district program specialist that handles all of these type of disputes. And I'm gonna show you what they do later on in the presentation. Then I became an assistant principal for one of our specialized schools and then they called me back to the district office to become the director of this particular uh, part or division within our county. You heard earlier about the parent engagement and the, and how, and the outreach processes that we have in place to um, facilitate ongoing conversation and collaboration with our families. What my department does is deal with the infrastructure. We built an infrastructure within our department to facilitate compliance and move compliance forward throughout the district to ensure or minimize the likelihood that we will wind up in a state complaint or in a due process. And I'll, I'll show you what that looks like. I, my department and what I, the majority of what I do is look at the data. I do sit in the resolution meetings. I do handle the state complaints. Uh, I handle everything on the non-legal side of Sarah. But in doing that, I'm, I'm very reflective. I always want to know where are, the majority of our issues lie, why they're there, so that we can build more proactive measures so, so that we don't have to go that route. When I look at the data, and I collect the data on a yearly basis, I have a team of administrators, we sit, we, we collect the data, and then we analyze and interpret the data so that we can move forward. We look at the state complaints that we received at the district level, and we, we, we try to form some assumptions about why we're seeing what we're seeing. And over the past three years, this is our data compiled over the past three years, we've had 64% of our total complaints coming from elementary school. Anybody have an idea why that might be? Any thoughts? Exactly. Uh, our child find our child find obligations. Be children being identified. Schools grappling with now that we've identified what do we do? How do we address the need? And sometimes we we hit the mark. Sometimes we don't. And we build capacity when we don't to ensure that our schools know exactly what we want them to do. Our second largest population of state complaints received our middle school, and which was really a surprise to me because I thought it would be high school. Our Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, it is high school. Yes, okay. Because, and when I looked at it, I was thinking, that looks kind of weird. It is high school. And why do you think it's high school? Transition. Exactly. Exactly. It's transition and it's post-secondary outcomes. That's when our families start to wake up and say, oh my gosh, we're getting to the end of his reign in school and his career in school. What are we going to do with him? How are we going to make the student a productive citizen? And then somewhere in between, we have our middle, our charter, and our district schools, which are our special day sites. Okay, our students, um, our, you all know what special day sites are. This is the data compiled over the last three years, kind of shows you how many complaints, how many state complaints we've received throughout the last three years. And if you look at that number, that's really not a high number for the, dish, for the, uh, the size district that we are, honestly. Uh, we try to handle the majority of our complaints at the local level. Honestly, we don't like, we like to clean up our own act, as Sarah said earlier. If we recognize there's a problem, we address it. We don't wait, we don't wait for somebody to tell us to do something. If we see it and we notice it, we address it. And my team and my staff is out there every day finding some of our errors so that we can be proactive. They're in our schools every day, okay? Finding some of these errors, they'll bring it back to the table. They'll t we'll talk about where we see patterns of noncompliance and then we address them immediately before a parent has to tell us and before the state has to tell us, okay? 
Um, we started, when I came to back to the department at 18, we went down one year and then we went up to 14. I really don't focus a lot on the number of complaints at this point because I recognize parents can file complaints just if they feel like it and they can file it for what they feel like. So I kind of got away from looking at the actual total number of complaints. My focus more is what the complaints are for. Okay, and that, that's the one prong. And the second prong is our level of culpability within you know, the complaint. Were we right? Were we wrong? Was it a misunderstanding? You know, where, do, where's the, where does the district stand in terms of the parents' allegations? So we're really not doing too bad. As I mentioned earlier, the top issues that are investigated are IEP implementation and our child find, basically. And it's usually for our smaller kiddos. It's our schools trying to figure out, you know, what to do and how to do it. When I look at this data, I, with my team, and I don't do this alone, trust me, with a district this size, I'd be, I'd be pulling my hair out. I do it with my team. We form assumptions as to why we think um, what we what the state has found are the issues and why we think these issues are happening and what we find in a lot of cases are capacity building a lot of our teachers just don't know what to do with the students and instead of reaching out to ask they do what they feel is right they do what they feel is appropriate sometimes we come in and we, we come in in a collaborative uh, a, with a collaborative approach and add to what they're doing. We don't say you're wrong, stop doing it, unless they really are off the mark. Uh, but for the most part, they're doing what they believe in their heart as a professional, a certified professional. Uh, and we just kind of come in and kind of tweak and kind of help them see the light a little bit more. Um, and then child find. The other thing that we have found, and when I train, my department is responsible for all of the professional development under compliance within our district. So we do build, that's a huge part of what we do, we build capacity. We train so that people know what the rules and the regs state so that they know how to move those procedures forward. Another thing that we find is in a lot of cases, our teachers and our teams are doing it. They're doing what's appropriate. They're not documenting it. And that's the key. Sarah and I tell them all the time, if it's not documented, it did not happen. Honestly, all of your great efforts are done in vain if you can't prove it if you can't verify it, if you can't take that data to an IEPT meeting and articulate it, it honestly did not happen. You've done it all for no reason, okay? So I, we always emphasize and re-emphasize to them that documentation is critical. And what we find a lot of times is that state complaints, you can go back one year. Due processes, you can go back two years. Once the teacher has removed the child from the class, the child has graduated to the next level, what do they do? They send the paper, her work home with the child, all the data home with the child, or they trash it. So if the parent comes back the following year and says, you know, my child is not doing well in this school year because the teacher last year did not prepare them, we go to the teacher or the school from last year and there's nothing there. Yeah, and so we, we have a lot of conversation about not only how to compile data, interpret data, but how to maintain it. Even with, when the child is gone, how to maintain it or pass it on to the next level. The process. I'll just talk to you about how we monitor in a district as large as we do. And it, it sometimes feels like this formula as we move through the process. The key piece is to build a, a proactive infrastructure before we ever get to the complaints, before we ever get to... Uh, the due processes, we've got to have a solid infrastructure in place that for monitoring and for data analysis to see how our programs, to monitor ourselves. Our state does monitor our uh, district ESE program through our self-assessment, but before they even walk in the door, we've looked at it ourselves, so we know where we stand. When we get their results back, it's no surprise to anybody because we've already done it ourselves. And in order to do that in a district this large, the, it is important to have a solid infrastructure. And our district, our school board member and our superintendent has committed to putting the right people in the right places. They've committed the resources in terms of the positions and the people we're allowed to hire so that we can monitor in terms of effectiveness and efficiency. Okay, this is my team and we are called, we are affectionately called the enforcers. We, we take that, you know, so it depends, it depends on who says it, you know. It could be a compliment or it could not be a compliment, but we are truly the enforcers. I am the ESE director. I have a senior director who's in charge in my absence. So she's running the district now while I'm here talking to you all. 
She supervises our instructional team and, and our compliance monitors. Her main job is compliance. That's what she does throughout the district. And she has a very solid team that serve as our eyes and ears, our boots on the ground, and they they report to, directly to her, and compliance moves forward. I also have a learning community program specialist. I want to draw your attention to the last two layers of the pyramid. These are our eyes and ears in the district. These are our boots on the ground. These are the people who are in schools every day looking at compliance, ensuring that compliance moves forward. If it, they're in classrooms, they're working with compliance monitors, they're in IEP team meetings, they are all over the place. And our schools know they're coming, okay? So in, in some cases, they like to see us coming because we're very helpful, very resourceful. In some cases, we are the enforcer. And so they know we're gonna come tell them to cut it out. I, I don't wanna slow you down, you okay. have so much to cover, but just real quickly, okay. uh, what's the nature of a, of a position like that? So in other words, do they come from special education? Are they, That's a good question. Um, are they college degree people? Like who, who are they? Their background, for the most part, they come, they have some ESE background. It is a requirement in order to uh, even apply for the position. So they were, most of them were ESE teachers to some degree or LEA representatives in for school, school as school designees, but they do have to have some degree of a foundation in ESE. The rest, they don't come with all the knowledge, but they come with a solid enough of a foundation that we can train. The district staffing specialists are teacher level positions, okay. so they're instructional. They're instructional. Mm -hmm. The other three layers are all administrative level. It's just one, you know, yeah. what level it is. Okay, and, and we, do, we build it that way because when you walk into a school, you find noncompliance, the first step is to address it with the compliance monitor on, on campus. And that's where our instructional staff can have those conversations. If we are finding that um, some resistance, if we're finding that the procedures that we're recommending that move forward are not moving forward, we have to escalate up to the administration in the school to make sure that they know what's going on or what's not going on in their school. Those conversations are had by, also, by other administrators. We don't allow our instructional uh, staff to have administrative conversations. So we have different layers for the different layers that are represented throughout the district and, in, and within schools. That's a very good question. Okay, let me make sure I told you everything. Um, oh, and, and, the, the, and so in, in their life, their life, 90% of their life is to be proactive, is to ensure that compliance is moving forward. However, once we get a state complaint or due process and the process has broken down, their roles flip to reactive. And I tell them all the time, in our department, our focus is more reactive, less, more proactive, less reactive. So on the, on the front, we spend the majority of our time being proactive, trying to make sure things are in place, things are appropriate. If people need training, we train. If, people, if, if there are processes that need correction, we correct. However, once we receive those due processes or those state complaints, now we have to go into the reactive mode. They also handle that piece. They go into schools, they conduct interviews. Once we receive a state complaint or due process, they go into the schools and get our data for us. They, they can do interviews, they can do uh, cumulative reviews on students, they can do classroom walkthroughs, student observations. They go in and kind of find out exactly what's going on or what is alleged to have been going on, okay? And that, that's their role. So it just kind of depends where we are in the dispute resolution process as to what their role is. But they are very flexible individuals. All right, so the learning community program specialists work with the school-based representatives and the teachers to verify services, whereas our district staffing specialists who are instructional, they make sure all of the IEPs are in compliance, all the I's are dotted, all the T's are crossed. That's kind of what their function is. They, they will train our staff and specialists who are our compliance personnel at the school. They will do side-by-side -side coaching. They go out maybe two or three times a week depending on the level of need and the, the level of resource required for that person. Of course, we put more time into our new people, our, our personnel who's new to the position, we spend more time with them. Our seasoned people, we just kind of make sure that they are up and running and, and following the new rules and regs as, as required. A huge piece of what we do in terms of being proactive, proactive is that we train. We do a lot of training. We all know that the world of compliance changes on a regular basis. And we've got to find a way, a systematic way to get that information 
to uh, disseminate that information to the persons who need it, who are doing it on day to day, who are on the front lines. So we do district-wide trainings. We hold about two or three of those a year. And that's when we have new state board rules come down. We make sure that they get that as soon as possible. When you know things at the state or the uh, federal level change, as soon as we get it, we make sure that we convey that to them so that they have it in their hands. And we translate it for them to tell them what it means in practice, not only in theory. So we have about two or three of them uh, a year. And then we also have many trainings on a monthly basis. We train our staff monthly on the day-to-day -day parts of their job. Like I said, there's a lot of, there's high mobility in these positions. We can train someone one year, and then the next year that person is no longer there. So that school now doesn't have a trained person. So we ensure that we train monthly on those, you know, day-to-day -day job responsibilities to ensure that compliance moves forward. Uh, forward. Uh, Dr. Stanky talked about the administrative modules. Uh, which our department, had, we developed a few of those, and the Summer Institute. When we look at our state complaint data, as I said, at the end of the year, I analyze that data to see where our patterns and trends of noncompliance are. And based on that data, we put together uh, an institute in the summer to train on what patterns we've seen. So it's very, our trainings usually are very relevant and they're very, very data driven. We train on what we've seen a lot of because we assume that people just don't know but we want them to, okay? All right, a database. We also maintain a database that helps us keep track of our state complaints because if you've got more than one state complaint running at, a, at, a, at, a, at one time, it can become nerve-wracking, okay? So we, we developed a database that monitors and tracks all of our state complaints so that we can ensure that we meet the deadlines from the, D, the Florida DOE that they've imposed on us. So I use it to not only track where we are in the process, but I also use it as a data collection tool to see where some of our concerns are so that we know how to develop our professional trainings, our professional developments. Okay. And this guy looks like I do on, on a good day. That's true. On a good day, this is what I look like because the investigation of ESE, you know, I would, especially with paper reduction, I don't, I'm not sure if they, we have that uh, um, throughout the country, but in Florida, we're supposed to have paper reduction. We don't have paper reduction. We have more paper than we've ever had before. So this is what I look like on a good day as I'm going through all this, these um, state complaints and collecting the data, reviewing the data, that kind of thing. The first step in our state complaint process is that the, the DOE sends us an acknowledgement letter. And what that letter does is it tells us what the parent has alleged. Okay, it tells us what we are being accused of. And immediately when I get the acknowledgement letter, I forward it on to the principal and I forward it on to his boss, his or her boss, so that everybody is aware that we have a parent who has filed a complaint, okay? And, and that we know shortly thereafter, there will be an investigation at the, on behalf of the, um, the state. So we have to start getting our ducks in a row. It buys us an extra few days in time for us to investigate prior to the state coming in and telling us what they want to investigate. So we've got two investigations going at the same time. And like Sarah said, we are the first ones to notice when there are problems. And if there are problems, we immediately start fixing. We don't wait to be told to fix. We immediately move forward in, in fixing the process. So the first thing we do is consult with, and once I, once I get all of the data from the school, and I always give the school an opportunity to tell me their version of it because I know there are three sides to every story. There's your side, that, their side, and then somewhere in the middle is the truth. Okay, so once I gather the data, I've got the parents' allegations, I've got the school's version of what happened, then I consult with the Bureau and because they want to know, the, the um, DOE wants to know exactly what happened. So I am the liaison and I talk with the, uh, the representatives from the DOE and I talk about what the school says happened, why the school said it happened. The second thing I do, or, or, and, and this doesn't happen first and second, actually it can happen interchangeably. I, I meet with or talk to the district and school staff to kind of find out if there's a question I have about the data. I meet with them, I discuss it with them, I talk with the bureau, and then we reach out to the family. We communicate with the family and determine whether they w are interested in early resolution. If the parent is willing to allow us to resolve it locally, because a lot of parents don't know we're there. A lot of parents don't know that we're an option. And so, or they feel like, well, 
you're one of them. You're not, you know, you're on their side. And we let them know, you know, we're not on anybody's side. If we're on anybody's side, it's the, it's the side of the child. Because we want to make sure our children get what they are entitled to. Okay? And so we reach out to them. We let them know that we're here. We're very interested in resolving this with them locally. If, they'll, if they're willing to come to the table and sit down with us, you know, we go for it. Once I've talked to all of the stakeholders, so now I've had a conversation not only with the school, had a conversation with the DOE, had a conversation with the parent, I pretty much get a handle on whether this is going to be able to be resolved without third, with or without third-party intervention. Okay, and if if I think it's something that we can resolve at the district level, you know, I, I, I explain that to the DOAE. I say, give us an opportunity to work with this parent and they will. If I think that, you know, we haven't done anything wrong, if the school has done everything right and they have the data to verify it and justify it, I, I, I let the DOE know, you know what, we'll go for it with this state complaint and we'll let you investigate and tell us who's right and who's wrong. Okay. The state goes in, they, they take all the data that I've looked through, and like I said, I'm not surprised, I'm never surprised, because I've looked through it. They go through, they tell us what's wrong, they tell us what they think we've done right or wrong, and if there is something that we've done in terms of a violation, they let us know that through corrective action. We move the corrective action forward through this document. This is a document that I take out to the school, because the report that's developed by the Bureau is very, um, it's not written in layman's terms. Our principals don't understand it. They don't know how to interpret it. They don't know what it means. I create this report so that I can put it in layman's terms for them to tell them what the issues are, what the Bureau found that was, that was incorrect, and who's going to do what to fix it, and what our timelines are. What our timelines are. Our timelines are much more stringent than the Bureau's, okay, because we have internal timelines. Time that we adhere to. So I go out and I explain it to the lay people, you know, and all this ESE lingo, what, what that means, what we're going to do, what's next, and we move it forward. One of the key pieces that, I, that we do, the DOE will tell us what they think we should do for corrective action, but at the district level, we also determine what needs to be done as corrective action. So sometimes our recommendations and our actions um, exceed what the Bureau is requiring of us because we want to make sure we don't have this issue again with this school, especially if the school is a repeat offender. Then we make it much more difficult, much more challenging to let them know don't do it again or you're going to have to answer to the district. Okay? Tips, and I've got two minutes. Okay? Two minutes. These are the tips that I uh, recommended when dealing with dispute resolution, it's particularly a state complaint. Fix your own noncompliance. That's huge. If our schools are more afraid of us than they are of the DOE because they know that we come out and we will exceed what the DOE requires and it makes them very uncomfortable and they don't like to be uncomfortable. So fix your own noncompliance when you see it. Submit only the documentation requested. What the Bureau asks us for is, is what we submit. Okay. When I first came on board, I would submit all this wonderful stuff thinking, you know, oh, I'm going to be, oh, they, they sent me this, I'm going to send this. And then they started investigating other stuff. I'm like, wait a minute, don't do that. You know, so I only submit what is asked of me because I learned very, I learned very quickly. They start digging into other places they're not supposed to be. Provide narratives to plead your case. Draw the district through your data because a lot, a lot of times when they're investigating, you're not there. You let your district tell, I mean, let your data tell the story. Draw them a picture with your data. Give them narrative so that they, because they were not even a part of this. They don't know what's going in. They're coming in with a cold set of eyes. Your data and your submission should draw a picture for them so that any lay person can read it and understand exactly what happened. And um, carefully organize the data. We tab our data so that they can find it. And oftentimes, once they receive the data, they will come to us and ask, um, questions so we tab it so that we know what they're referencing okay and then exceed the bureau's requirements for corrective action okay it, pro it proves a point to our school sorry I ran over guys but you guys have been a great audience and if you have questions we'll kind of hang around until the next group comes in They're more afraid. They're more afraid of us than they are the DOE. But in in the end, we get better results as a result. 
Exactly. The kids win. Yep. Thank you, guys. Enjoy the rest of the conference.